Well, good morning. Uh, welcome. So glad you're uh, here with us this morning. Just a couple of announcements. We have a pretty uh, uh, t- traditional week of Bible study, um, but we do have a couple of changes coming up in the community ministry uh, for, uh, I guess, almost two and a half years now. We have been outside all the time, and recently we moved back to allowing some of our, our guests to come in and choose their own food. Well, we're restarting our community dinner, so that's a big step forward for us. Um, it has been a great opportunity for our community to get together and just spend time with one another. I think we probably, at some sometimes, we've had as many as 80, uh, 80 individuals up there enjoying dinner together. So we're going to restart that. Uh, this Tuesday at 4.30, so if you'd like to come and hang out with the folks in the community, we'd love to see you. Um, we're still doing to, we'll still be doing to-go dinners for those that aren't comfortable uh, coming in on Tuesday, but um, if you'd like to come join us uh, at 4.30 on Tuesday afternoon, we'd love to see you. Um, so our call to worship this morning comes from Revelations chapter 15. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let's worship together. Please stand and join with us.
surrender my life. I'm in all of you. Well, I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. Lord, I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Lord, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Amen. How true the words of, of those, the lyrics of those songs, right? That I owe all to you. Uh, we're coming through in Bible study uh, for the adults, but Sunday school, we're coming through the letter of Ephesians and come through Paul's prayer and we're getting into chapter four and we're just talking on the way over, in fact, Angela and I about just that, the application that's there in just, you know, two, three verses uh, that we do owe everything to, to God, that it was out of his great love that he chose to love us. Uh, sinners, enemies that we were of his. Uh, what a great God, what a great love uh, that Jesus has for us. Amen. Let's continue to praise him. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, my sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's thoughts and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Praise the Lord. And when before the throne I stand, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I have asked Brother Sky to uh, come to a scripture reading for us this morning. Thank you, Brother. And those slides should be on there. Good morning. Good morning. This reading is from Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 17. It says, uh, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in, in all his ways and love him, mm -hmm. and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and, and to keep the Lord's commandments as his statutes 
which I am commanding you today for your good. Mm -hmm. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth, and that that is in it, that that is in it. Yet on your fathers, yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. So circumcise your heart and stiffen your necks no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of good God, the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the almighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Amen. Thank you, brother. Yeah, he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He is uh, impartial in all that he does. Uh, God is good. He is loving. He is kind. Uh, and as I think about us coming to a time of, uh, of us giving back to the Lord, uh, those are the things that come to mind. Uh, remembering, as James tells us, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord, uh, that everything we have is the Lord's. And uh, Pastor Steve has doing, been doing a great job the last several weeks. It seems like, it seems like usually on Sunday, uh, Pastor Steve is doing the offertory prayer, uh, so we thought we'd change it up a little bit this morning. But just continuing on the principle of everything that we have is God's. Uh, the idea isn't that, uh, you know, I give 10% or whatever the, the tithe of the Old Testament we know is in the Old Testament law. But in the New Testament, we're told to be cheerful givers. And even when you go to look at the Old Testament tithe, uh, it was really about 23 and a third or so percent of, of what they had they would give. And so it's not that I am to give 10% of my money and then the 90% I have, I can do whatever I want to with it. The idea is everything that I have is the Lord's, and thinking of what Paul says in Romans 12, uh, to present yourself a living sacrifice to God, that everything I have, uh, the giftedness he has given me, the, the blessings of family and children, the resources, everything, the time, the talent, the treasure that we always talk about, everything has been given to me by him. So I am called to then give everything back to him. And so uh, I pray that we would give cheerfully uh, and obediently as we're called to do and that the Lord would, would use us uh, in this place. And so let us pray and, and ask him. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We do recognize you as the creator of the universe, uh, the sustainer of all things, and Lord, the giver of all good things and every perfect gift. Lord, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so, Lord, we come to you seeking that you would uh, use us, Lord, that, that uh, you have called us to a work beforehand, we know, it, it tells us in Ephesians 2, and Lord, we know that you have a work for us to do as individuals, but also collectively as, as this church, uh, First Baptist Island Rod, and also collectively with these other churches that are true churches proclaiming the gospel in the Florida Keys and in the rest of the world. And so, God, I pray that you would do a great work in your church, that you would uh, purify your church, Lord, in these trying times that we find ourselves in. Uh, but, God, that we would come at this time and that we would give uh, cheerfully, that we would give obediently, and that we would do this in order to see uh, the work be done here that you've called us to. Lord, help us to uh, better do that, and through your spirit, that you would equip us, uh, enable us to do the things you've called us to. Lord, we ask that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there is an offering plate in the front, and there's also one in the back if you prefer that. stand and let's praise him. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing our darkness now the light of life has come look to christ who condescended 
took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, he the perfect son of man, in his living and his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ the Lord upon a tree, in the stead of ruined sinners, hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Behold the wondrous mystery Slain by death, the God of life But no grave could ever restrain him Praise the Lord, he is alive What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes oh what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes praise the lord you may be seated Do you have any children heading out this morning? Who's watching the kids today? <laughs> Jill is doing it. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> We'd be in trouble if you were doing it, Craig. <laughs> well, good morning again. Uh, we just have a, a tremendous opportunity to spend time in prayer uh, with our God. And um, there is some of the writing that Paul has done in the New Testament is just so encouraging to me. And uh, there's uh, some verses here in chapter 4 of Hebrews where he's talking about our ability to approach the throne of God with the things that we need. Uh, so this is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For do, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And this is the verse that it just is amazing to me. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come before you with our needs. So let's pray. Father, we love you, and we are so grateful, uh, Lord, that you've given us the opportunity to uh, come to you with the things that we need. Uh, but first, Lord, we are just so, I'm just so overwhelmed by your greatness. Um, as David said in Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise, for the Lord is a great God. Father, we are a needy people, and uh, Lord, we are grateful for everything that you have given us, uh, but Lord, we uh, at times do things that we shouldn't or leave unthing, done things that you would have us do, and Lord, we seek your forgiveness. Uh, Father, give us the strength to do the things that you've called us to do, Father, 
to be the light uh, of the world, and especially here in the Upper Keys, Lord, help us to be the light. Uh, help us to preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Uh, Lord, um, there's so many things that are happening in our body. Uh, Lord, I think of the youth that are all heading back to school. Lord, we pray for safety for them. Uh, Lord, we pray for a great school year uh, and one that would be full of great learning. Lord, I think of the community ministry this week and our opportunity to help families in need. Lord, we praise and thank you for your provision. Uh, we pray for strength, Lord, to deal with just the overwhelming need that exists in the community. Help us to be uh, a place where people uh, know that they are loved. Uh, and then finally, I pray, Lord, for a family that's leaving us this week, one that has been, uh, Lord, just so much a part of who we are, and my heart is broken uh, that they are leaving. But, Lord, I'm encouraged, and I know that you have a great plan for them. Lord, we pray for the Jagtianis that uh, you would help them in their new mission that you've given them. Father, that you would protect them, that you would give them safe travels, and as they uh, integrate into their new community, Lord, you'd help them find a body of believers uh, that they can be part of. Lord, we love them. We ask for your blessings and your favor on this family, Lord, and we thank you for the blessing that they have been for us. Lord, as we approach this time of um, uh, uh, preaching your word, I pray for Pastor Craig. Father, that you would speak through him and that you would open our eyes and ears to the things that you would have us learn today, Father. Uh, may this word that you've given us bind to our heart. And Lord, we just thank you for loving us and sending Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Pastor Steve. Well, good morning, everybody. Please uh, go ahead and take your Bibles out and open up to Genesis chapter 37. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 37. Have you ever heard something or been told something that uh, it, perhaps it could have been a secret? It might not have been such a secret. Perhaps it was something that was told openly uh, to you or to a small group or a larger group. Um, really, the, I don't think it, it matters so much. Uh, but the information or the story that you heard, um, you know, it prompts or causes other people to scoff or to mock or uh, to perhaps even get angry about what it is they're hearing. Uh, but yet there's something that prompts you uh, to not react in such a way that you may want to react uh, in your flesh or seeing other people do that. Sometimes we kind of join in with that. Uh, but something in there um, causes you to respond in a different way, uh, that you consider what you heard and you take it to heart. And uh, something inside you, you know, just prompts you to ponder this thing that's been said and you want to uh, see what is going to become of it. And even as I say that, I just think of the gospel, right? Because when the gospel is proclaimed or people hear the gospel, we know that they react in many different ways. If you've ever witnessed to anyone or shared the gospel with people, you'll find that people, some will be receptive and listen. Uh, others may get angry. Others may mock you and scoff you. And so we know uh, that this is a good scenario there that I'm thinking of. But uh, we're definitely going to see that, I believe, some uh, in the text here this morning. And so by way of review, let me kind of set the stage for where we are. I know we've got some visitors here. And um, some of you maybe that weren't here last week, certainly some missing this week, perhaps watching online. Uh, but I always like to set the stage with some review. We've come through the first 36 chapters of Genesis, and so bear with me while we review 36 chapters. Uh, th that's not really going to happen. Uh, we, we may be here until next Sunday. Uh, but as we get into chapter 37, uh, we are transitioning into a different time here uh, in, in our focus and things that we'll see today and probably some of the stories that a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, but as we do that, we have seen, in fact, uh, 2,200 years of human history thus far. So understand, even by the time we get to verse 2, where we see Joseph is going to be 17 years old, uh, we're around 2,217 years or so, okay? But roughly 2,200 years from creation, which is remarkable when you think about it. So that's about 1,800 years before Christ will be born in a manger, right, in his incarnate visit. And so... It is remarkable when you think we're only in the first book of the Bible, and we're only 36 chapters in, and yet we've seen a little over a third of human history. So we've been through a lot 
uh, already. And so we've seen in that a lot of genealogies, right? A lot of the generations of Adam and of, of uh, Seth and of Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and all those things. And in fact, two weeks ago, uh, we looked at chapter 36, which remember was the uh, generations of Esau and the genealogy of Esau. And so all those things, uh, I tried to show us that how it all points to, you know, the genealogy of one man, right? Christ Jesus, who we know is, is God, uh, but we know that he was also 100% man. Um, Paul, as he writes in 1 Timothy, he tells us that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Jesus Christ, okay, or the man Christ Jesus. And so all those genealogies, again, just point us to Matthew 1. They point us to the genealogy we find there of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And so really that's what the entirety of the scriptures is about right? We always talk about that. This is one story. It's pointing to one main character, and it's all about, you know, God's plan of redemption. And so it should be no surprise to us. We're going to continue to see that as we move forward uh, in the narrative. Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a varicolored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us, or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much that we can call you Father. That, Lord, as we see this text and we read of a relationship between father and son, it just points us to the relationship, Lord, that we have as your children, that you have chosen to love us with such a great love that you have adopted us to be co-heirs with Christ. Uh, Lord, what a, what a remarkable uh, thing this gospel is. What an amazing grace. What an incomprehensible love, Lord, that you have shown to your people. So God, I pray that you would further uh, this work that you have begun in us here this morning. And as always, Lord, I know that your word as it goes out will not return void, but it will do exactly what you have ordained for it to do today. So God, I pray that you would allow me to humble myself, that I would get out of the way, that you would speak to me, that you would speak through me, that you would speak to your people. And God, if there are anyone here, uh, any here who have not understood and not believe uh, the gospel that brings eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, God, I pray that today you would open their eyes, remove the scales from their eyes, that they would see the truth of the gospel that brings life. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of today's sermon is The Dreamer. So as we look forward uh, and we start to speak about Joseph, I think uh, many of us are probably familiar with the story of Joseph, even growing up in Sunday school, teaching VBS, all those types of things. Uh, we're probably very familiar with it, so that's always a, a good thing, but also can maybe be a bad thing, so I would encourage you uh, to not check out and think, you know, well, I know all about Joseph and his brothers and, and the multicolored, uh, you know, tunic and, the, and all those things, uh, but we know that, again, God's Word continues to, to speak to us. It is living and active, and it continues to uh, guide us and, and give us more information and knowledge and application. So I pray that that would be the case uh, today. And so we begin with the generations of Jacob. 
And this, like I said, is the final section really of the book of Genesis. When we get to chapter 37, we go through the end to chapter 50. Uh, this is the last section kind of of the generations or the genealogies of this family. We know that uh, Jacob or Israel as now is his name. Uh, he is the new patriarch, right, from Abraham to Isaac, now to Israel. And we will see now that, uh, you know, we, we shift forward, moving forward here a little bit um, into the 12 sons now of Israel, okay, is going to be where we're shifting our focus now. Um, it says in verse 1 there that Jacob, or Israel, lived in the land where his fathers had sojourned. So look back with me real quick uh, to chapter 35. It's only a couple pages back probably in your Bible. Look at verse 27 of chapter 35, and we find and are reminded of where this was. Okay, uh, 35 verse 27 says, Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. So we know that this is the area we're still talking about from a, a few weeks ago, and uh, that it's in Hebron that they sojourned, or remember they were sojourners, and we talked a lot about that over the last several months, about this idea of sojourning and being uh, having this temporary residence. And remember that we too are sojourners. Uh, this is just a temporary residency for us, right? We are passing through here. Our citizenship is in heaven, and so we look forward to that. But we have a duty and a job and a responsibility while we are here passing through, okay, and being sojourners. So as we continue to follow this uh, lineage, these generations of, of Jacob, of Israel, Knowing, if you know any of the story and how it progresses, we know that the line of the Messiah is going to come through which son of Israel? Through Judah, right? So you would think that the focus of the narrative would be on Judah because he is the one from whom the kings will come as we saw that told to, uh, to Israel a few weeks back, that Judah will, be, will become the line of kings in Jerusalem. We know that David will come through that line, and Solomon, his son, and then on down through the line comes Jesus uh, through this line. And so you would think that that would be the focus. However, we find that uh, the Holy Spirit inspired Moses uh, to write about Joseph, and I think we're going to unpack and, and realize why that is the case more as we move forward. So we are going to focus um, more on Joseph. And now, even as I say that, I have to remind myself, uh, as well as all of us, to say, understand the primary focus of these chapters and of this entire book is on Jesus Christ. Amen? So even in that, we will see, uh, we'll come to find that Joseph is a great type of Christ. He is a picture or representation of Jesus Christ in so many ways, and perhaps you've done a, a study on your own of that. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to, because it's very enlightening. It's very, um, it's very neat to see how that is. And there's so many characters, Joshua and Moses, and many who are used as types of Christ, or meaning that they picture or they resemble Jesus, who is, his, who is to come. And so, for instance, I think of Joseph's life actually being divided into two segments, uh, being his humiliation and then his exaltation. Okay, if you're familiar with his life, he will be humbled through the first part of his life, but then God is going to exalt him and use him after that humility. And that parallels Jesus because think of Jesus's life, his humiliation. We just sang about it in that song, his condescension right? Look to Christ who condescended is what it says there. Come behold this mystery, this wondrous mystery. And so in that, Christ was humbled. He humbled himself to become one of us, but then God highly exalted him, right? As Paul says, and bestowed on him the name that is above all names, that at his name, every knee will, will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, Again, just the, the picture that we see points us to, to Jesus Christ. And as we uh, progress through the narrative, we're going to see that uh, even more. Uh, but I want you to see that text, in fact, in, in your own Bible. Let's turn to Philippians 2. Uh, go back to the New Testament and turn to Philippians 2. We're going to read verses 5 to 11. Just what a remarkable truth it is here as, as Paul is telling us to 
uh, you know, to have the same mind with another, one another, to be of the same love, the same accord, the same spirit, not to be prideful, but to be humble uh, in ourselves and doing nothing out of pride or vainglory, but esteeming or thinking or considering others above ourselves. And now as we get to verse 5, he gives us Jesus as an example, which Jesus is always the ultimate example for us, right, in, in all things. And so we look at verse 5, and it says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, right, because he was God, he did not recall, regard equality with God to be a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself or humbled himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of a man. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Amen indeed, and praise God. If you're here and you can do that this morning, praise the Lord that he has revealed that to you and you are able to do that now before that day that one day everyone will do that in, in judgment that we find later in Revelation. So we see that Jesus greatly humbled himself and then he was greatly exalted, okay, in, in the condescension that I was speaking of before. And that is I mean, that's the gospel, right? That's the heart of the gospel. This condescension, why did he do that? He did that because of his love for us. As Paul speaks of in Ephesians 1, in love he did these things. It was out of his great love that he humbled himself. Think about God leaving heaven, Jesus leaving where he's being sung to and glorified and praised by all the angelic beings and everything in creation. Is, is made and created to glorify him, he leaves that behind to take on this flesh. I, I mean, that is, that's why we call it a condescension. You can't condescend from any higher high to a lower low than Jesus did. And why did he do that? Because of his great love for his people. Because he understood and knows what the truth of the Bible tells us, that because of our sin, we are alienated for all of eternity from this holy God. And every sin, every thought, every action, every lie, every you know, emotion that is against his law that you or I have committed has built this chasm that we cannot cross, that we cannot be in the presence of a holy God. And that's the bad news of just who you are and who I am. And that is the truth of what the Bible tells us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And so we rightfully deserve death and we rightfully deserve to be alienated from God. We rightly deserve to be punished for the wrong that we've done against Him. And yet in that, God chose to show His mercy and to the praise of his glorious grace, he chose to be gracious out of his love to save sinners like you and me. What a glorious truth this is. This is the gospel. This is the good news that Jesus came down here. He lived a perfect life, as Pastor Steve alluded to in, in Hebrews there, that he, he understood and understands who we are because he lived a life like us in the flesh, but yet he did it perfectly without sin. And in doing so, he was able to be the propitiation, the satisfactory payment to appease the wrath of God. When he died on that cross some 2,000 years ago, he paid for the sins of every single person who will ever believe in him. And he was able to do that. And therefore, he satisfied the wrath of God that should be upon me because of my sin, and it is not because Jesus paid it all for me and for you. And the Bible says, if you will repent and believe this truth, you'll be saved and have eternal life and that he is preparing a place for you and will return one day to receive you and to take him there. Uh, what an amazing, awesome God we serve. Amen? So praise him for the truth of the gospel. And if you believe in that, take to heart the gospel and realize what love God has for you. And if you do not believe in that, I say to you what Paul says to you, May today be the day of salvation. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ.
Well, this also serves as a reminder to us <clears throat> that the servant is not greater to the master. Um, how Acts 14 tells us, uh, Acts 14 verse 22 says that it's through great tribulation we must enter into the kingdom of God. And we're going to see that to be true in Joseph's life as well, uh, that you must go through difficulties in this life. Uh, remembering and thinking of Matthew 7 and Jesus' words of uh, broad and wide is the path to destruction, but narrow and straight is the gate that leads to eternal life. It's difficult, and there's difficulties and trials and tribulations in this life, but it brings us to the glory of Christ and in His kingdom. Again, we'll see that as we move forward in Joseph's life as well. Uh, next, I want us to look at the favoritism of Joseph, okay, is our next heading. So back to our text, verse 3 tells us that Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons. Well, that's problematic, I think we can all understand. Uh, we've looked at this and talked about this in, in prior uh, chapters in our study here of Genesis. But now, why would this be? Why would it be that Israel loves Joseph more than his other sons. Well, the text tells us here, it says that this, it is the son of his old age. However, if you skip forward to chapter 44, you will find that that same phrase is used in regards to Benjamin also. It says that Benjamin is the son of Israel's old age, in which both of them actually were the sons of his old age, right? So if we remember he has 12 sons, um, Joseph and Benjamin were the last two born. And so they are, you know, the, the sons of his old age. And in fact, remembering uh, this may be another reason for his great love for Joseph, because remember, who was Joseph and Benjamin's mom? Rachel, his beloved wife, Rachel. So Joseph is in fact the firstborn, right, the eldest son of Rachel, his beloved wife, who we've seen has, has passed on. Uh, remember, she died in childbirth, uh, giving birth to Benjamin. And so in that, uh, we know that if you do a quick math, you'll find out that when they get to, uh, skip ahead, spoiler alert, that in the end of the book of Genesis, we will find that Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. God has put him there to uh, fulfill this plan of God to save Israel. He brings his father Israel and his brothers to Egypt, right? And so then we carry on to the book of Exodus. But in that, um, we see that Joseph was used greatly uh, by God to do this thing. And if you go to the math, you'll find that when, when Israel came to Egypt, he's 130 years old. And at the same time, Joseph is 39 years old. So quick math, we could talk about it later if you want. Uh, he's 91, we come to find out, that Israel is 91 years old when he gives birth to Joseph. And so he's older than that when he gives birth to Benjamin. So we see that he, they are the sons of his old age, okay? And so remember, a lot of that was God's doing because that mother, Rachel, as we think about it and consider it, why did she not have children until that time? Remember, she was barren for a long time, as was Rebecca, as was Sarah. Just in God's providence, we see the way that he orchestrates these things. And so there's a couple reasons there that I, that I try to list, but certainly it tells us here that uh, he loved him more than the others. And uh, according to verse 4, it says this, this partiality, right, or this favoritism is visible to Israel's other sons. So apparently, he wasn't hiding the fact that he had this great, outstanding love for Joseph. In fact, it seems like he's parading it around for everyone to see as he gives them the multicolored coat, right, and all those things. It's, it's very visible um, to the sons here that, uh, that dad loves Joseph more than he loves me. And, and so, uh, just a quick passing point, because we've talked about this before, but uh, what a problematic thing that's going to be, right? We're not to show partiality and favoritism uh, in our family, but, but, you know, even out and past that. Uh, you know, you've probably heard the expression, like father, like son, and that's what comes to mind now, because i just recalling, as perhaps you are, just remembering back to when, uh, remember between Isaac and Ishmael, right, that Abraham favored Isaac. And of course, we could say God favored Isaac also, okay? But then we get to Isaac, and we see uh, who was it that Isaac favored. Remember, Isaac actually favored Esau, while mom, right, Rebecca, favored Jacob. And so then we know also that God favored Jacob, 
over Esau. For Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And so we see this as an uh, ongoing pattern in, in this family. So it's really no surprise now that we see Jacob acting in the same manner that his father acted and that his grandfather acted. He, in fact, probably picked up a lot of this from them, right? Uh, that is not a, a good thing. Um, and so we recognize in that, uh, parents, certainly, that there are, there are good things, right, that perhaps our parents have practiced according to the truth of God's words and good morals and things like that that come from the scriptures that they practice in the raising of us. And so there are things that we should mimic and we should imitate. Uh, think of 1 Corinthians 11, 1, uh, where Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ or follow me as I follow Christ. You're not following me. You're not listening to me. You ultimately are to be following Christ and you can follow me and listen to me as long as I am also doing that, right, is Paul's point. And same, same with me as a pastor, same with us as parents, that there are those things that are honoring to God that are glorifying to him that we should practice and mimic from our parents. However, there are also attributes and characteristics and things that our parents probably did that would not be good for us to mimic and to imitate, right? Are there perhaps things in your life that you want to break those chains, you want to break those things and not pass them along uh, to your children? Uh, turn with me, please, to James chapter 2. Let's go back to the New Testament again. book of James. Let's see what the half-brother of the Lord has to say in regards to this. Chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 1 to 5. He says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in, uh, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom in which he promised to those who love him. Do you see it? Partiality, favor, you know, these aren't to be things that, that are shown by us and that are attributes that we have, because why? Uh, James says there that we're not to be partial. That's because God is impartial, right? God is impartial. Um, Romans 2.11 says there is no partiality with God. Ephesians 6, 9 again tells us there is no partiality or no favoritism with God. So favoritism or partiality is against God's character. It's against his values. It's against who he is. Uh, not only is it disrespectful to people, right, to discriminate in that way, but James tells us in verse 9 of chapter 2 that it is in fact sin against God to do that. I think of David's words as he says, against you only have I sinned. I might be prejudiced in my heart, and you may not be able to notice that I'm discriminating against this person versus this person. God knows, and it's a sin against God to think this way because it goes against his character. So we see here in this example that Israel does a poor job, uh, and that his favoritism of Joseph actually helps lead to uh, the hatred of Joseph, which is our, our next heading, the hatred of Joseph. We're going to continue to see that, uh, but we see it much laid out here in, in these first verses of chapter 37. Uh, while Joseph was dad's favorite, we see that Joseph was certainly not the favorite of his brothers, right? Um, text tells us three times here that they hated him. So why did his brothers hate him so much? Well, we've got a few reasons listed right here. Look in the text. First being, it says, you know, because he told on them. We see right there in verse 2, it says that Joseph brought back a bad report of the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. So remember, uh, the 12 sons have four moms. And so we look at these sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Those are Dan, Naphtali, and Gad, and Asher. So four brothers in particular that are spoken of here. Uh, and somebody might inquire, uh, as my mind inquires and says, well, what about, the, what about the sons of Leah, right? Or the others, like, where were they? 
I don't know. They're not mentioned here. Maybe they were there and they didn't do the bad things that Joseph was reporting. Maybe it was just that they were the only ones there. But we have these four sons uh, being told on by Joseph, right? Joseph brings a bad report of them and their actions back to dad. And so we know uh, usually that doesn't generally go well with the siblings when one tells on the other. And so we certainly see that to be the case here. Uh, Second, we see because his father loved him more. Right? It says, because he loved them more, they, they notice this, and they hate him even more. Uh, verse 3 and 4 make that clear, that his love for Joseph was more than that, and they were aware of the fact. And thirdly, it's because of his dreams. The dreams of dominion over them caused them to hate him even more. So we've got hate, more hate, and more hate, and, and just continuing to boil over in these men Uh, the hatred of their own brother. As verse 5 tells us that Joseph told his brothers his dreams and they hated him even more. So Joseph's two dreams, we're not going to unpack those a lot. We will unpack those in in future sermons as we look uh, into the text more. But today the focus I I want us to to focus on is the relationship of the sons of Israel, as this is going to lay the groundwork of where we're going. And so uh, in our humanity, I think we can understand probably why Joseph's brothers hate him, right? We don't like to be told on. We don't like to have somebody like someone better than they like us. We certainly don't appreciate if our parents love our sibling more than they love us, and we're aware of that, and they make it known to us. So I think in my humanity, I can relate in, in, the, in the sense of understanding why they would hate him or why they would be mad and, and angry at him. Not to mention, what about these crazy dreams that you're having that are saying, like, I'm going to be bound down to you? <laughs> like, come on, man. This is just getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and so I think we can understand that. But that is, in fact, why we are called to not react in our humanity that the scriptures call us to not react or respond in the flesh. Because I often want to respond in the flesh. I want to react just like these guys did. I want to go throw them in a well. I, I want to go sell them. I want to, you know, all the things that they do, I want to do uh, to people in my humanity. It's normal for us to get angry. Um, certainly when somebody points out our faults or tries to admonish us. Uh, Matthew Henry writes in his commentary on this, He says, it is common for friendly monitors to be looked upon as enemies. Those that hate to be reformed hate those that would reform them. Wow, (laughs) right? That is so true. Uh, And and we know it's true because it points to uh, that he derives this from the scriptures, Matthew Henry does. Proverbs 9, 8 says, do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Those who are wise are able to take reproof and are able to receive instruction and are able to grow from that, and they will love you for that. Those who cannot take it well and don't want it aren't going to react very well when you give it. Anybody ever notice that in your life? Anybody ever even been that person in their life who didn't receive it well, didn't take it well? And so we know this to be the truth, the truth for us. And it points us to a greater truth. Um, for us in particular, that it is common for those who are loved by God to be hated by the world. Those who are loved by God, it is going to be common for us to be persecuted, to be hated, to be not looked kindly upon, uh, to be scoffed, to be mocked, um, to be persecuted. All the things that we see happen to Jesus, right? As, as we talked about that earlier, that, that the servant is not greater than the master. We should expect these things uh, to be true. In fact, let's turn to John chapter 15 and see what the Lord has to say about it. John chapter 15, back to our New Testament. If you're not uh, familiar with making your way around your Bible yet, you turn back there and you'll find Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John. If you get to the book of Acts, you've gone too far. John 15. Verses 18 to 20. Jesus says to his disciples, and I would include the church in that if you are a disciple of Christ. Verse 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. 
If you were of the world, the world would love its own. We find that so true, don't we? If you are of the world and endorse the things of this world, you will be loved. You will receive the accolades. If you celebrate what the world celebrates, you will be celebrated, and, and you will be honored in their eyes. However, he continues, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the, world, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And so just a principle that we certainly see throughout the scriptures, that it will be difficult for us who love God and for those who love Christ and follow him. 1 John 3.13 says, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. So do not be surprised, believer, when your family members respond to you the way that they do, especially if they're unsaved or your neighbor or your coworker or whoever it is in the way that they react to the way that you act, to your words, to you sharing the gospel with them. Uh, we should understand that these things come with the territory. Now, I don't say these things to upset you or to discourage you. In fact, I would like to turn that around to encouragement, um, understanding that all of that being said, we know that the scriptures teach uh, greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. Amen? Jesus wins. God wins. Satan is a defeated foe. Be encouraged. I think of Pastor Brian as he closed out last week. Um, you know, preaching last week, um, we, we took a break and, and he brought us a, a sermon uh, on topic of speaking of, remember, parental priority and, and just focusing on uh, trying to keep the main thing the main thing, right? Especially as parents and in our homes and that the greatest thing we can pass on to our children is a legacy of Christ. And we know that that's God's work, but we have been called to be responsible to teach them and train them in the way they are to be raised in the admonition and discipline and understanding and instruction of the Lord. And so be encouraged uh, remembering these things that we again are citizens of heaven. We are not citizens here. That's why you don't feel at home here. That's why I don't feel at home here with the things that are happening in the world, things that are happening around you, the things people say, the way they treat you. Yes, it's not fair. Yes, it's uncomfortable. That's the life you're called to as a Christian. Remember, Christian means little Christ. What did Christ's life look like on this earth? Look at what we have in the Gospels of that three years or so of his public ministry. Was he persecuted? Was he mocked? Was he scoffed? He was killed? And so, again, the servant not being greater than the master is to understand this is a reality, but... Again, I want to encourage you. I think of Jesus' words as he encourages us. Um, John 16, 33, he says, in this world you will have tribulation. But he says, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. James tells us, rejoice when you face different types of trials and tribulations. Why? Because knowing that God is building your perseverance and your patience and your faith your love, your grace, your mercy, let's, whatever else we can tag into this, all these things that we're to be growing in to be more like Christ, typically we grow to be more like Christ when we go, things, go through things like Christ went through, right? Think of, remember, the olive, uh, how do we get the oil out of the olive? By putting in the press. How is it that the church is refined? It's like gold, going through the fire, going through the trial. The disciples being on the sea when they're tossed to and fro and Jesus is sleeping in the ship and, Lord, Lord, don't you care that we're going to die? He's the one who's the master of the waves and the wind and makes it all calm and says, I'm in the boat with you. There's no reason to panic. There's no reason to be dismayed. I'm with you. Everything is going to be okay. And that's the message that he gives to us through his word as his children. So do not lose heart in doing good. Uh, Galatians 6, 9 tells us that. For in due time, you will reap if you do not grow weary. So do not grow weary. Brethren, do not grow weary, but grow strong 
do not lose heart, but, uh, you know, be courageous, right? And be bold for the Lord. Be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this day. Thank you so much, God, for this time and for the privilege it is that you have given us your word. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So, God, it is that gospel that has been proclaimed and pre- pre- preached to us through your written word and that the power of the Holy Spirit has caused us to be born again. And so, again, we give you thanks and we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for this life you've called us to. We pray uh, that we would do as Paul instructs us a couple times that I can think of to live a life worthy of the calling by which you've been called, to live a life worthy of this gospel that has saved us. God, would you please equip us to do that? Uh, For we can do nothing without you, but we know that with you all things are possible. So God, help us to not lose heart. Uh, Lord, help us to, to strive to be bold and courageous and strong in you, uh, that we would not be uh, showing impartiality, that we would be continuing to be like you in all ways, Lord, in every aspect, that you would continue to transform us, Lord, uh, renewing our minds through your scriptures, that your spirit would uh, continue, Lord, to, to grow in us in the sanctification process we are under. Lord, we thank you for this process you've begun. We thank you that you promised to complete it and that you're continuing it. God, help us to be strong and in our responsibility and our side of things to continue to put one foot in front of the other, that we would not walk in our flesh, but that we would walk in the Spirit. Lord, we pray all these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our parting benediction comes from number six this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great day.